these days of unprecedented technological advancement in which microchip implants and invisible barcode tattooing exist, some Christians anxiously await the day when all people will be required to receive a microchip implant or an invisible universal product code tattooed on their wrists or foreheads. Can we really expect modern technologies such as invisible barcode tattoos to penetrate every last corner of the world? I see no reason to believe that the UPC code or microchip implant is what the Bible calls the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is defined in Revelation 13 as, quote, the mark which is the name of the beast. First, we need to understand that in the Bible, a name does not always indicate a literal name, as modern Western mind understands the term. In the Bible, someone's name is essentially a reference to the nature, character, and mission of the one who possesses it. It need not indicate a literal name per se, as it commonly does in the West. Consider, for example, the following references to Jesus. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God, Revelation 19.13. Or, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19.16. There is also the well-known passage in Matthew from the prophecy of Isaiah, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, Matthew 1, 23. In all of these passages, the names of Jesus are never literal names. If Isaiah prophesied that his name shall be called Emmanuel, and we insist on the literal name Emmanuel, then Jesus would not be Messiah because his literal name is Yeshua and not Emmanuel. We must think beyond the surface. So in the case of the Messiah, Mary and Joseph did not call him Emmanuel, nor did Jesus' friends call him the Word of God. Instead, these are all titles and or descriptions that refer specifically to the nature and the character of Jesus. Also, the creed or declaration of faith in this Messiah matches his name. So in this case, the title is really the creed or the declaration of faith in the Messiah. He is the Emmanuel, God with us. This indeed is our creed. This matches his name for we believe in God with us and the word was God and he is also called mighty God, Isaiah 9 verse 6. Those who call Jesus by these names affirm that they worship the man befriending God who for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. This is the Nicene Creed, of course. He is the Word which became flesh and dwelt amongst us, as in John first. In conclusion, the name is a creed or a dogma or an article of faith or a statement of faith. The significance of the name of the beast per se, is that it is the name of blasphemy, as the Bible says in Revelation verse thir chapter 13, verse 1. Biblically speaking, blasphemy is an anti-Yahweh or anti-Christ word or deed to claim the attributes of God, claim to be Messiah, deny the Holy Spirit, deny the Trinity, the cross, or even denying God's edicts and declarations are all blasphemy in accordance to the Bible. Satan, for example, blasphemed God when he said, I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 14. Satan has always desired to be like God. He wishes to be considered equal to or greater than Yahweh. The name Allah in Islam is always used in conjunction with the word Ta'ala, the Most High. If we look again at the verse, we see that the name of the beast is not simply a name of blasphemy, but rather it is the name of blasphemy. It is the highest quintessential blasphemy. It claims to possess 
the attributes or nature of Yahweh, the God of the Bible. As such, the name of the beast is a claim to be equal to or greater than God and the Messiah. The name of the beast will contain or imply some form of anti-Yahweh, an antichrist doctrinal or creedal language that will exalt another above Yahweh. Beyond denying the Trinity, Islam also denies the divine incarnation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as well as his death, burial, and resurrection. But beyond all of this, Islam has memorialized its anti-Yahweh, anti-Christ theology, specifically in a creedal formula. In Islam, the Shahadatan is the Islamic creed or declaration of faith, and it's the first pillar in Islam. In the Arabic, it reads as follows, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. This means, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the one sent by Allah as the messenger of Allah. The two elements of this creed are the following. Allah is the only one true supreme God, and Muhammad, the praised one, is the seal and final messenger of Allah. These two components of the Shaharatan, in a very succinct manner, perhaps better than any creedal statement, could perfectly fulfill both dimensions of the definition of blasphemy that we just discussed. First, it attempts to claim that another God, other than Yahweh, is the only true God. And secondly, the Shahadatan is blasphemous towards God of the Bible because it attempts to place Muhammad in the position that only Jesus, the Messiah, can fill. Muslims identify Muhammad as Al-Insan Al-Kamil, the perfect man. Rahmatin Al-Alameen, a mercy to all mankind. Al-Rasul Al-A'zam, the greatest of all sent by God. Shafi, the healer. Al-Munji, the savior. Mahdi, guided one, deliverer. Al-Mustafa, chosen. Amir, the prince. Awwal, the first. Akhir, the last. Rasul Al-Malahim, messenger of the last day's battle. And finally, Muhammad, the praised one. Such are the blasphemous names of Muhammad. Praised one is definitely not a title to give to a man. The praised one can only be a title and an, and an attribute that belongs to only God. One cannot call somebody the praised one on earth. Yet despite the quintessentially blasphemous nature of the Shahadatan, it is recited into the ear of every Muslim child the moment after they are born. It is the verbally expressed outward sign of conversion to Islam. According to biblical theology, the Shahadatan could not be more perfectly blasphemous. The next obvious and essential observation that needs to be made is that all four of these elements, the mark, the name, the number, and the image of the beast are indicators of allegiance and submission to the beast. Quote, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patience, endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 12. In the simplest of terms, the mark of the beast is essentially the emblem, the symbol, or identifying mark of the coming beast kingdom. By donning this mark, people will identify with the kingdom of the beast and the values and beliefs that the kingdom represents. The next point is essential. 
The mark of the beast, the identifying symbol that is, of the Antichrist's kingdom, is not something that someone might accidentally embrace or receive. It is rather an outward indicator of an inward allegiance or submission to the beast. It is something that one must choose to accept willfully. The scriptures make it clear that anyone who receives the mark of the beast will spend eternity in hell. One cannot accept the mark of the beast without also implicitly denying Christ. Biblically speaking, it is only a denial or rejection of Christ and his gospel that can cause any individual to end up in hell. Sadly, I've actually spoken with a few individuals who, although they reserve absolutely no room in their lives for Christ, adamantly swear that they will never accept the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast is not some loophole or backdoor clause that Satan will use to bypass God's normal biblical standards of justice in order to slip as many people into hell as he can. Yet, as foolish as this may sound, there are many who perceive the mark of the beast in precisely this way. In receiving the mark of the beast, there is an implicit acceptance and identification with the very specific anti-Yahweh and anti-Christ theology. The Greek word karagma, used for mark, means a stamp, an imprint mark. So as a follower of the Antichrist, will have a stamp on some sort of material as a badge to be placed on the forehead or the arm. In John's time, the use of karagma was reserved for slaves in what was called a badge of servitude. So it is a badge that declares slavery and ownership by the master, and followers use it to demonstrate allegiance to this master. This would fit with Islam, since according to Islamic theology, Muslims are slaves of Allah. Islam is the religion of submission. These followers have an option to either place this badge of servitude on the foreheads or the arms. Western analysts think that the mark is placed on the hand. This is not necessarily the only spot. We know from the Greek word dexios, which could also be translated right side or right arm, right shoulder. Amazingly, and in keeping perfectly with what the Bible predicted so long ago regarding the beast and his mark, the badge is in fact an Islamic commandment from the Prophet himself. Quote, Allah will save a man from my nation, Muhammad says, a man from my nation above all creation on judgment day. In front of him will be laid 99 registers for his sins. Every register is as long as the eye can see. Then he is asked, do you deny any of these sins? Then he says, no, O Lord. Then he is asked, do you have any excuse? He responds, no, Lord. Then he is told, you have but one good deed, and there will be no condemnation for you today. A badge is brought forth. Scrolled across it are the words, no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Then he is asked to bring forth his deeds. He asks, O oh Lord, what is this badge that is with these register? He is told, you will receive no condemnation. The deeds are put on one hand and the badge on the other. Then the registers will float and the badge will outweigh the register. This is registered by the Turmudi 2639. To sum it up, the name of the beast, along with variations of the name Allah, is worn on a sign of submission on the right arm or foreheads. Islam is submission and allegiance to a foreign god. That shahadatan is blasphemous from a biblical perspective. This badge is worn by Muslims on the foreheads. All of these things meet the biblical requirements of the mark of the beast. And just in case you are still in doubt, even the part of the Bible 
that predicted the beast will mark the foreheads in the, is in the Quran itself and in the hadith as well. That, that Al-Ard, literally the beast out of the earth, is an Islamic version of the account of the beast of the earth in Revelation 13, 11. But unlike the Bible in which this beast is evil, the Quran gives him a holy mission to revive Islam and mark the foreheads of all true Muslim believers. According to Islamic tradition, the beast emerges in the last days, quote, and when the word is fulfilled concerning them, we shall bring forth a beast out of the earth to speak unto them because mankind had not faith in our revelation. This is Quran chapter 27 verse 82. Quote from the Hadith as well, the Prophet of Islam declared the first of the signs that will come is the rising of the sun from the place of its setting and the emergence of the beast upon the people. Whichever of these two occurs before the other, then the other is right behind. Can you imagine my shock when I studied the Bible? I was taught that a beast would come out of the earth and he would mark the foreheads of all Muslims. Do you see how Satan has turned everything upside down for Muslims? When I was a Muslim, I wanted the mark of the beast. Not surprisingly, according to Islamic tradition, this beast comes out of Mecca. The Prophet took me to a place in the desert near Mecca. It was a dry piece of land surrounded by sand. The Prophet said, the beast will emerge from this place. It was a very small area. Even as the last day's beast religion has emerged out of Mecca, so also Islam has the beast emerging out of Mecca. Amazingly, the Bible, the angel took John to the desert to see this woman or prostitute riding a beast that most likely comes out of the desert of Arabia. For many years, the teaching that the harlot of Revelation is Rome or the Catholic Church has resigned within many Protestant circles. Today, most Western analysts have diverged from this theory, and rightly so. Yet the problem of searching for alternatives leaves many in the dark. Most Western analysts are looking for a global harlot that combines all religious systems and is political in nature. Like Rome was, yet neither Rome nor this combination, universal religion harlot, conforms to many of the basic scriptural descriptions of the harlot. The harlot must be connected to Arabia, not Rome or New York or any other nation or city. In Isaiah 21 verse 9, Isaiah levels a prophetic oracle against Babylon. Quote, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is the same announcement used in Revelation 18, 1 through 2. Yet this prophecy is not ultimately about ancient Babylon or today Iraq, but the mystery Babylon of Revelation. Ancient Babylon was simply a type of the last days Babylon. The names in this prophecy are all areas in Arabia. The burden against Duma in verse 7. The burden against Arabia in verse 13. All the glory of Kidar will fail, verse 16. Duma and Kidar are in Arabia, as the text shows, quote, all the glory of Kidar will fail, as in verse 16. All of the locations mentioned in Isaiah 21 are in the desert of Arabia, the region of Revelation 17 which is surrounded by many waters or seas. In fact, in Isaiah 21, verse 1, it says, the burden against the desert of the sea. This is a desert in the midst of oceanic waters. Arabia, in fact, is referred to by all Muslims as al Jazeera al-Arabiya, literally the Arab desert island or the Arabian peninsula, desert of the sea, verse 1. There are many conjectures concerning Mystery Babylon. Some say that Babylon is the United States of America or the Vatican. However, 
None of these theories are supported by the text. Remember, we need to be strict when we examine the Bible to contain our study within the text of the Bible alone. Either students of the Bible build a mold from Scripture or they make the Scriptures fit their theories. There's only two choices. There are really only these choices. Once we read the text of Isaiah 21, it becomes quite clear. An oracle concerning the desert by the sea. Isaiah 21 verse 1 again. This is not the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in Iraq, but on a literal sea surrounded by the mass of waters in the Persian Arab Sea or Indian Ocean and the Red Sea surrounds this massive desert. It is also thought that the sea may be referred to the Nufu Desert, a virtual ocean of enormous sand of dunes. The camel was called the ship of the desert, the only formidable vehicle to transport through the sea of sand. Some might argue that the context of Isaiah 21 is only historical regarding the Babylonian invasion. But it is difficult to ignore the multiple references throughout the book of Isaiah to Kidar, Tima, Didan, and Dumma. Dumma is in Saudi Arabia near Yathrib or Medina and today is known as Dumma al Jandal. Dumma, one of the sons of Ishmael, is also associated with Edom and Seir in Isaiah 21.11. It is believed by many that Kidar, another of Ishmael's son, is the line from which Muhammad descended. It is likely that Mecca is the glory of Kidar, mentioned in verse 16. We will also examine the crucial text of Isaiah 34, which is the destruction of Edom, including its oil. It would be impossible to allude to Isaiah 34 as a historic reference because the purpose of the destruction against Edom there is over the final battle for Jerusalem in which the Lord himself will be present and fighting. In Habakkuk 3 as well, this takes place in Midian, which is in today Arabia. The Psalms even gives us a literal reference to Edom being the daughter of Babylon, born from, from Babylon. Quote, Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, to its very foundation, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. Psalm 137, verses 7 to 8. Arabia is definitely the daughter of Babylon, since it was made so by Nabonidus, who extended Babylon to Yathrib and Medina. This is a well-documented historic fact in which the Babylonian worship of the moon god was introduced to Arabia by Nabonidus. In all of these Old Testament prophecies concerning the utter destruction of Babylon, they cannot be speaking of the ancient city of Babylon because it was inhabited for roughly 500 years after these prophecies were given until around 141 BC when the Parthian Empire took over the region and the city was emptied of inhabitants. After this, the city slowly decayed but it never suffered a fate anywhere near the utter destruction that was suffered by Sodom and Gomorrah with fire raining down from heaven as many of these prophecies describe. Speaking of the destruction of mystery Babylon, we read, quote, No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. Isaiah 13.20 this cannot be attributed to Rome as some teach. Arabs never pitch their tents there. The ultimate fulfillment of this verse is the destruction of the last day Babylon. We know this because the passage speaks about, quote, the day of the Lord, verse 9, with the heavens not giving light in verse 10. This is not historical, but end times related.